From the Great Patriotic War into the Nut and Fancy Project, TMP for short, for testing and review, this is of course the much beloved Mosin Nagant Battle Rifle. By the way, I'm going to Americanize the pronunciation as I've done in past videos. I just call it the Mosin Nagant. Yeah, I know that's not exactly correct, but last time I checked, I'm still American. It's easier for me. Just going to call it the Mosin. Thanks for watching the video. Thanks so much for the support. And for thousands of TMPers out there, i.e. subscribers to the project, who have wanted this review, thank you for your patience. Um, I first showed Mosins in the project in 2009, early 2009, and ever since then I've been testing them. Not like continuously, but off and on, uh, three Mosins have been in the project. I've ran about a thousand rounds between two of them. One of them I didn't shoot, it's this one. The other one I shot the line share and there's another one I'm going to show you. So I have three representations of Mosins. Um, I think it's going to be a fun review if you are a fan of the rifle. Um, and perhaps if you're not a fan you might find some stuff that's interesting and you might become a fan by stuff I'm going to tell you here. There are a lot of great things about the Mosins, which I absolutely love, which make them a part of my inventory, both for recreation and other purposes, which I'll talk about, as I always do. You know that. Lots of detail to cover, short time to get there. Let me set down some tenets, okay, some rules of the road for the Mosin review that I'm going to do here now. Please bear with me. First off, a lot of guys are really passionate about the Mosin. I understand that. Uh, I'm one of those, but I'm also uh, very passionate about a lot of other systems, a lot of other rifles, and I keep an open mind. I ask you to do the same thing. If guys roll in and go, hey, Mosin Nagant, Mosin, whatever you want to call it, best battle rifle ever made, it is not. Okay, there's a lot of great rifles out there that can compete and do better than the Mosin in all types of categories. Okay, I'm just going to lay that out there. It's just the way it is. You know, and it's very debatable, even guns of the same era, whether it's a Lee Enfield, uh, you know, whatever mark you want to choose, a Mauser K98, Yugo K98, Swede M96s, you know, the Schmidt Rubens. Um, there's a lot of great bolt guns out there. Springfield 1903, Arasaka, the Japanese bolt gun. Uh, I don't know a ton about all of these guns. I do know that a lot of them have a lot of great features, they're accurate, they're powerful, maybe less powerful than the Mosin, maybe more reliable, more accurate, I don't know, it just goes on and on. But to just categorically say the Mosin is the best gun ever, you know, if some guys that's the only gun they can afford to shoot and buy, and then because they own it, huh, sound familiar, I've talked about this a thousand times, it's the best gun ever. And anybody who criticizes it, you know, they lambast it. I don't want to see that in the comments, okay? So please don't do that. Don't make it unpleasant for everyone watching the video. Keep an open mind. Here's another tenant. Uh, guys may say, hey, don't mod the Mosin. Do not modify it. It should stay in its stock form. Obviously, you can see one here Duracoated. I'll talk about specifics when I get to the accessories talking point. Um, I kind of disagree with that, and here's why. I say you do what is going to provide the most enjoyment to you because there are so many Mosins out there. Uh, perhaps before you go modify it, you might want to do some research on your variation on the cartouches that your gun carries on the receiver, the stock. Is it a rare example? If it is, you may not want to modify it. I'm with that. I understand it. 17.5 million of these guns were made. Most of them have been rearsenaled, decreasing their value. I think you're okay to modify one. Or if you're like me, you buy one to modify, you get another one to keep stock. These are both octagonal receiver guns. This is a Tula, that's the Ishvesk Arsenal version. Okay, go that way. But get the enjoyment out of the gun. What gives you the most enjoyment in this particular firearm, I say go ahead and mod it. Again, I would ask that you keep an open mind on that as well. Some guys may disagree and go, no way, you should keep it in historical form. It's going to gain in value. I predict it will not gain in value. There's too many people doing that, keeping the guns in stock form. If we fast forward to 10 years down the road, I bet you very few Mosins will gain in value, if at all. 
you might even increase the value. Like if I were to sell this one as modded like there, I think it would go for more. Maybe not. I think it would though. Okay, so I'm open to modifications. Enjoy that, but I'm also attuned and sensitive to certain variations of the Mosin are collectible. I'm not going to go into which ones. That's a subject for a lot of research, and maybe you want to keep that one just stock. Also, here's another tenant rule of the road. Each gun is an individual, I have found out, in shooting the Mosin. One may have a really slick bolt. It may be very accurate. You go to another one, it has a very stiff bolt. Yes, the chamber's totally clean of Cosmoline and everything. Still runs very stiff. This gun's kind of that way. It has a very stiff bolt, but it's extremely accurate. Everyone's an individual. So some of my data that I'll share with you here, keep that in mind. I'm giving you some data points as generated by my own testing, lots of testing, but it doesn't necessarily, necessarily apply across the board to all Mosinagans. It just can't. Each one's an individual, especially the varied history. They're re-arsenaled. Maybe this bore was neglected. This one wasn't. See where I'm coming from? Um, also, another rule of the road, I'm not really going to go into the history of the Mosin. I might dabble in it here and there, but I just don't have air time to do it. And there's so many other resources for that. Uh, one I'm going to turn you on to is a book, The Mosin Nagant Rifle by Terrence Lappin. Outstanding book. I highly recommend it. If you want to know all the variances, he's put in a lot of work on this. There's this is like the fourth version of the book, I think. Yeah, there you go. Fourth edition goes into all the different stampings, the variations, which ones are valuable. Um, really, every detail you could possibly want to know on the Mosin. Right here, baby. Oh, and by the way, I love this quote from Terrence. He goes, This is just what I was saying, kind of. He goes, that Mosins are now so common, especially in the form of arsenal refinished rifles and carbon carbines with no collector value, that one can shoot them extensively without the nagging dread that one is abusing a potential museum piece. I agree, Terrence, Terry, however you go by. Um, that's exactly what I said earlier. Uh, shoot it. Have fun with it. Let's jump into the details of the Mosin. And of course, I like to lay the foundation of such with a little thing I call philosophy of use. I use the word philosophy of course to encourage a thought process on how you're going to integrate the gun into your systems and also to have some realistic expectations on what it can and cannot do for you. Okay, POU number one is probably not what you think it's going to be from me nothing fancy. You probably thought I was going to say end of the world gun, right? Yeah, I'll get to that. POU number one though is fun gun. That is a recreational firearm. You bet. Good luck trying to spend $100 better than you will on your Mosin. Yeah, I know. It might be more. It might be less, depending where you live, where you get it, when you get it. But let's just say around $100, this provides an astounding level of fun. It is a center fire rifle providing center fire recoil and the challenge of firing it accurately, especially if you're doing it in a run and gun scenario like you see here in TMP. I think that's highly encouraged. It's a lot tougher to run that way than you would think. A little bit of stress, go try it, and it is an absolute rush. The Mosins are so fun to run that way. Um, and you get a real appreciation of what it's like to become proficient on what is essentially a 19th century battle rifle with a few 20th century upgrades to it. Yeah, fun gun, absolutely. I will also say this, this kind of goes hand in hand with that, project gun. Yep. Just like I said in the beginning, you might just want to modify your Mosin for your own enjoyability. Yep, all these guns are safety checked, by the way. I'm not going to waste air time showing you. It's hard wrangling them all on the table, too. Project gun. Just like you see with this one, I'll get to the details later. Duracoated has a red dot sight, and it provides a higher level of enjoyment to me personally. And actually to all the crew members that have ran it too. They've loved it. No one has shot this gun and come away and said, oh, that sucks. They love it. It's fun. Okay? It's fun tweaking a Mosin and getting it, I don't know, to a level you want. Again, if you're a Mosin purist, a Russian firearms purist, that may stick in your craw. Be open-minded though. Again, I don't think the collector value on most of these is going to go up at all. Well, that's my prediction, unless it's a rare variant. Um, I'll get to that here in just a sec. Let me show you Mosin number three. In the project, in TMP, it also did a bunch of shooting. Uh, let's see, this one's going to come off the table right here. I numbered them. This is Mosin two I'm taking off the table. <laughs> I told you I'm going to be smacking the tripod. It's a lot of steel and wood. 
getting wrangled here. All right, here we go. Before I show this, uh, I had Mosin number three, which I'm going to show you right now. Uh, I degreased it, and I was very unhappy with the looks of it. It just looked horrific. Um, the stock looked bad. It was patchy. It was not attractive at all. It didn't personally give me any enjoyment at all. Every time I looked at it, I go, man, that's ugly. And actually, the to be honest, the Mosin itself overall is not a super handsome firearm. If you compare it against, I don't know, Mauser K98, come on. It's just not. Except when you do this. Check that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Everybody thinks I'm all about Duracoat. Nope. Only when it's appropriate. I love wood if it's done right. I stripped this gun all the way. I degreased it. And I refinished the wood. Look at how that turned out. This is a birchwood stock on a Mosin Nagant Ishvesk Arsenal dated 1938. Beautiful. I was shooting it at the range the other day. The guy wanted to buy it. He's like, hey, can I buy your Mauser? You see the triangular, triangular wood insert there. Also, I kept the cartouche on the stock. Didn't sand that off. I was like, no, no, I'm not selling it. And this is a Mosin Nagant. He's like, what? <laughs> yeah, he loved it. He's it's just beautiful. That's golden oak by Minwax. Once I stripped and sanded um, the stock, then afterwards I put two layers. I got to tell you the details because guys are going to want to know. This stuff right here. Free promo for Minwax. Wipe on poly. Two coats of that. That essentially makes it waterproof and it gives it more depth and luster. Uh, luster sounds like a shampoo commercial. Um, but it waterproofs it and it's just beautiful. When I took it to the shooting range, I didn't even have the poly on it yet, the polyurethane. It was just uh, the golden oak. It was a coloration of stain I put on it. Yeah, I modded this one. By the way, this is an aftermarket sling on this one. Made in China, but it looks brand new and actually the quality is pretty sweet. Um, beautiful though, huh? I love it. I think it's gorgeous and it gives, again, me, the owner, a lot of enjoyment. And that's what I mean by project gun and that's the bottom line is uh, if it has enjoyment for you, hand it down to your children. It'll be a connection. Hey, dad modded this out. It's going to be a little bit more uh, enjoyment there too. Let's jump into collectability though. There's two sides of collectability. I got to go fast on this. I don't want to burn a lot of time. First type is I'm going to get a special type of Mosin. Maybe it's a rare receiver stamping stock. I don't know. There's a myriad of, of uh, Mosins out there. There's 10 basic varieties, but a bunch of sub varieties modifications, you could research it and find out which ones are valuable and you could spend a lot of time collecting those in the hopes that they go up in value. Will they go up in value? Um, maybe, I think uh, it all depends on what other people do. In other words, if everybody says, hey, I'm gonna collect my Mosin and keep it in its stock form, guess what, it's not going up in value. It's only what makes it valuable is a rarity, right? If the gun is rare, then it goes up in value. But if there's, you know, 25,000 people collecting the same gun, they're keeping it in the same condition, guess what? Your value is not going to increase. It just won't, unless the gun itself is extremely rare. Okay, so that's one side of collectability. You're hoping it goes up in value. I think you could choose a lot of different guns, heck, forget guns, a lot of different items, and do much better than you would the Mosin and Gaunt. Okay, so I think that's kind of a, I don't know, dead end street for me personally. You're, again, you may vary in that. Second side of collectability, which I think is much more realistic, is the enjoyment level it gives you personally to you and then perhaps to your family. Because it's so affordable, let's say around $100 again, you can get a whole collection of Mosins. Now granted, they may not be super valuable according to the type of receiver, the stock and all that, but it's fun going out and looking for them and collecting them and then someone who's interested in guns and the history of this firearm, of which the Mosin has a lot of, it's fascinating. It's a cool to have, what if you had a collection of 10 Mosins, you bring them off the rack and each one has an interesting history. It was re-arsenaled here. Perhaps it fought in this war. Very, very cool. And I will say the Mosin in, it, in and of itself pretty much popped on a scene for a lot of people when the movie in 2001, Enemy at the Gates came out. Yep, Jude Law playing a Russian sniper, Vasily Zaitsev. Cool movie, huh? Yeah, and he was running a Mosin Nagant sniper version. That's what a lot of people that's when a lot of people learned about the gun and generated a lot of interest. They'd been around already, of course. You know, other Russian snipers used them too. Um, what was it? Ivan Sidorenko? Over five hundred kills? 
Wow. He died in 1987. Hero of the Soviet Union. Getting to the collectability. I mean, that's a lot of history. You know, I started the video off with a great patriotic war. Who knows what wars these actual guns have fought in. You know, since they came from Eastern European channels to the United States, chances are they saw action in World War II. Very high chances, actually. Um, maybe lower chances they saw, you know, conflict in Afghanistan. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe they went to Afghanistan, came, came back. Who knows? That's, that's another fascinating side. The Mosin has been a participant in pretty much every global conflict uh, since early 1900s. You name it, you know. Korean War, Vietnam War, World War I, World War II, Afghanistan, current conflicts going on. It's out there in such large numbers. It's very durable. They're still out there. Collectability, you bet. But on that side where it just gives you enjoyment and you enjoy the history and the intrigue, that's probably the best way to describe it of the Mosin Nagant. Next one, uh, Rawl Gun. That is W-R-O-L, without rule of law gun. Is it a great way to defend you and yours? I would say absolutely. You don't need a semi-automatic firearm. You don't. Um, there are some big downsides of a Mosin. That is, it's heavy, it's bulky, slow to fire, takes certain proficiency to run it well. Yeah, if you can get past all that, very, very effective. It served well in all those wars for a reason. That's because it works. It's good at doing its business as a battle rifle, the Mosin. So, you know, if, I hope it never comes to this, but as a burial rifle, i.e., you've got to just you know, put a rifle somewhere and hide it up. Hey, what better choice than a Mosin? If you can find a tube that holds it or make one long enough, it's probably where an M38, M44 would be better, shorter versions of the Mosin. Hide it up. It's a $100 rifle. See ya. It's a write-off. Throw some ammo in there. Good to go. WRL gun? Absolutely. Hunting gun. A lot of guys use it as a, I don't know, budget level hunter. Uh, and with great success, I say absolutely, especially if you're disciplined enough to keep it near its stock form or whatever mods you do. I'm going to echo this several times throughout the video. You don't go crazy and put a lot of money into it. I think it's a wise choice. A lot of meat put on the table by Mose and Nagants over the years. Still going on. There's lots of guys that have great success with it. Um, it, it does well as a hunting rifle. You betcha. Broad stroke, POUs. I got to press. Innovation and design. I'm not going to go into all the specifics, don't have time, and I also don't have the knowledge to really delve into everything that resulted in the design that is the Mosin Nagant. It is a collaboration effort between a Russian military officer by the name of Sergei Ivanich Mosin and his Belgian cohort at the time who helped basically with a magazine device as all his contribution was, my understanding. Might be off. Again, if I get some details wrong, I apologize. A uh, Belgian's name was Leon Nagant. And then there was a lawsuit later and a bunch of drama ensued, whatever. Basically, it's Mosin's gun. He designed it, and he did a great job with it. I'll tell you what, to fall in love with the Mosin, first and foremost, is to take it apart, which I did in detail with this one when I duracoated it. And when I saw it for the first time in detail, I'm talking after stripping it apart and looking at all its sub-assemblies, I was shocked at how simple it, the gun is. Rugged, reliable, and simple, huh? Just like all things Russian, right? That's the Mosin Nagant. Well done. I love simplicity. I mean, you look at the trigger on the Mosin, you go, there's no way that can work. <laughs> you just are baffled by its simplicity. You're like, is that it? Did I lose some pieces on the shop floor? Nope. You're looking at it. Very simple gun. By the way, these are 9130 variants of the Mosin Nagant. And if I get my details right, that means that they are upgraded to what's called, let me show you this version, a Type 4 sight graduated in meters instead of the pre previous Arshans, which was a Russian unit of me measure, about 28 paces. These are in meters. Different front sight, hooded, peep variety, different barrel band. By the way, in the stock, I hate to, this is so sad, this one broke. This is another uh, modification of the 9130, by the way. Stamped uh, hardened steel barrel bands instead of screwed on variety. Makes takedown a snap. And these are springs that retain them. This one cracked. Bummer. May replace it later. Those are the basic 9130 modifications. They did some receiver modifications. I think in 1936, they uh, discontinued the octagonal, i.e. hex receiver. Later on, they got rid of this step in the receiver for what they called a high wall receiver. Cool. Okay. Well, again, guys know about all this that devote themselves to the Mosin Nagant. Um, that's not me. 
I'm interested in broad strokes. Overall, the innovation is probably on par with other bolt action rifles of its day, not necessarily better. Again, I threw some names out there like the Lee Enfield, the Mauser K98, an amazingly strong and accurate and smooth bolt action rifle, uh, unlike the Mosin, lots of times. Those are equally good, if not better, bolt action designs. But I think the main thing you need to know about the Mosin is the test of time. That it's still around and it's still fighting in wars even as I'm videotaping this. Okay, that's a testimony to the design. That it's strong, it's reliable, it does what it was originally designed to do. Oh, by the way, it does fire a rimmed cartridge. The 762 by 54 r it is a rimmed round. Analogous in power between a 308 and 30 out 6, about 2800 feet per second. Um, I think rimmed cartridges are obsolete. There is a design feature in the Mosin that prevents supposedly rim lock. I'll talk about this later on. It's called an interrupter. It's in the magazine here. Uh, I'll show it to you. So that was kind of a uh, innovation back then. Um, it was a reliable, relatively fast shooting gun. Oh, and by the way, the Russians ran it with bay bayonets. I don't have one on the table. They're around the house somewhere. We're moving so much stuff around. I can't even keep track of it. Um, they ran the bayonets on the guns all the time. That was their philosophy, and it's a transitional rifle in a way. It was a 19th century battle rifle. Back then, it was very common to engage in hand-to-hand -hand bayonet combat because maybe, you know, with the musket, not muskets, but single-loading rifles, you know, next thing you know, you charge hand-to-hand -hand combat, and that was the Russian philosophy. Um, and incidentally, the guns are basically sighted with the bayonets on them. So when you take your bayonet off and your gun's shooting way off, talk about that in accuracy maybe, that's probably why it was a bayonet gun. Um, but that was just a little side street on there. Got to press. Weight, balance, and feel. Okay, uh, these 9130s on the table are 48, mm, I don't know, 3 quarter inches long, 8, and thir 8 pounds and 13 ounces. Not this one with the red dot. I'm talking this one in the back. Okay, um, different variations of Mosins are going to weigh more. There's one, I think the 1941 model was 51 and a half inches and weighed 9 and a half pounds. M38, 9159s, M44 is going to weigh less. They're going to be shorter. And actually, those are my favorite versions. I love the carbine versions of the Mos Mosin Nagants. I think they're cool. They're shorter, they're more portable. I haven't shot one yet, but I understand they're pretty much just as accurate. The M44, of course, has a dedicated side folding bayonet, um, but reports are it still shoots pretty good with a bayonet on. It's not an easy gun to carry around. Again, we're talking 19th century technology. Yes, upgraded a little bit in the 20th century. It's still a very heavy gun. Compared to modern bolt action rifles, it's completely outclassed, usually. I say usually because if you get one with a heavy barrel, it's, they'll weigh even more than a Mosin. Uh, the balance is actually pretty good. You know, carrying around the Mosin and hauling it around, it, it balances well, it goes to the shoulder quickly. I really had no complaints on that ergonomics and that's a great place to talk about that. I think the ergonomics overall are, let me start with the sights. The iron sights are actually pretty decent on the Mosin. Hooded front peep sight, I wish it had, I don't know, a longer radius. Like most Russian firearms, they have a very short radius on the sight. It provides a relatively clean picture. One of the things I found about um, the sights, however, is they don't provide enough depression I guess I should say. In other words this one is all the way down it's still shooting high for me. Okay it'd be nice to be able to lower it some more and that's again probably an outgrowth of the fact that this gun was shot with and sighted in with a bayonet. I can make some sight modifications to the front sight to correct that. I may have to do that in the future but the overall picture pretty decent. Pretty optimistic too what you see on the back side of a Mosin. A lot of that was intended for mast volley fire. That is lobbing rounds at long distances, hundreds of troops doing it on command. For you, uh, there's guys that report great accuracy, again I'm jumping ahead, at 300 meters or more. Um, I think it's capable of that. Um, the sight, so good picture. I wouldn't say they're outstanding, however. The trigger, however, is not so outstanding. And again, getting to one of the tenets I set forth in the vid, each gun is an individual. This particular Mosin, I call it number three, breaks at about six and a half pounds. Yeah, that's pretty good. The Duracoated one in the background, how about at 10 pounds? Horrible. But nothing fancy, there's things you can do to the trigger to make it lighter. Yes, I know that. 
but also you got to be careful what you do to ruin the uh, let me say the economy formula of the Mosin. Jumping ahead to accessories, I could throw a Timney trigger in there, but I don't want to spend hundred dollars on a Mosin, so I just live with the trigger. Okay, could I polish it up? There's some washers. I think some some somebody was saying you can put some washers in there to decrease the pull or something like that. I didn't do any of that. Yeah, you could fool around with it. Uh, I just run it how it is. Learn to learn to run it as it was intended. Uh, let me see other things in ergonomics. The sling, uh, I have no issues with it, and I run it. Again, this is an aftermarket sling on this one. I run it just the way it's intended. I'm not going to put a modern sling on the Mosin, especially on this one. The theme for this one is kind of, I don't know, World War II battle rifle. You know, granted, I refinished it. I didn't go with the lacquered Cosmoline covered stock that was, I don't know. So ugly. And again, every gun's an individual. This one is not horrible. Let me show you Mosin number two. But it's not gorgeous either, right? Okay, it's been in a crate for the last, I don't know, 60 years or so, banging around in Cosmoline. It's, it is what it is. Um, you can take this, you can take that. It just depends. It's kind of cool seeing the, all the variations right there, though. Speaking of stocks, how comfortable is it? Well, like all European rifles, it has a very short length of pull. I don't really find that to be too huge of a hindrance with the Mosin. You may vary, uh, especially if you run optics on it. I've ran it a lot, again, lots of rounds shot here in TMP, both with this, I'm talking with no butt plate on it, or the stock butt plate, and also with this, an aftermarket, you know, butt pad on it. I will tell you this, by the way, does not reduce uh, recoil at all. And yes, the Mosin does recoil, substantially. It's like a 30 out 6. You, you know, if you've got the meat of your shoulder taking the impact, no problems. When you go to the bench and your collarbone, starts coming into play. In other words, your collarbone rests on the, the butt plate or the butt pad. You're going to know about it after about 20 rounds. Voice of experience. It hurts. So, uh, actually, I like the recoil, though. It makes it funner to shoot. And, yes, I like the powerful cartridge that it handles. Uh, while I was shooting this one, incidentally, since I have an optic mounted, speaking of ergonomics, I have to kind of rest my chin on the back stock a little bit higher to come in line with that red dot sight the recoil would actually abrade my chin. And uh, Bugget Nestor, my buddy, was like, hey dude, you're like totally bleeding from your chin. I was like, what? And that's what it was. The stock was recoiling and abrading the skin. Didn't even know about it. It's war, right? Suck it up. Um, that's about it on the ergonomics. I think I covered most stuff. Oh, you're not gonna really open your magazine very often. The gun really isn't designed that way. You load from the top either by stripper clips, which by the way, I think suck. Ran them, tried them. Hey, nothing fancy, you didn't use them right. Uh, that's possible, uh, but I couldn't secure any Russian made stripper clips. I'm talking of the period, so I used aftermarket variety. Uh, I think they're made by AIM, imported from China, and we did not have good luck with them. If, in fact, if you're not wearing gloves with those stripper clips, you're probably going to take skin slash meat off your hands. Ouch! Watch out for those. Uh, we found it's probably just as quick to load it individually. Oh, the Mosin. And by the way, probably, no exactly. probably jumping ahead to reliability, durability, watch out for rim lock. But wait, the interrupter ejector is supposed to prevent that. Yeah, I know. In this particular rifle, uh, it was really strange. We ran this hundreds and hundreds of rounds and several times, even though we're being careful, trying to load them in proper sequence, it would jam on us. And I'd look down there and it was rim lock. And I looked down to see if the interrupter was doing its job, i.e. holding the second cartridge okay, down so the top one can strip off without rim stacking. You know, put, uh, and I thought it was doing it. And I, I really don't have a definitive answer for you guys. I, I don't. It was surprising. Uh, and then I'd run it again. Like I took it out in the desert alone and I was running it pretty aggressively. I didn't have any problems at all. Okay, I don't know. It's a rimmed cartridge. I think they're obsolete. Will rim lock happen to you and your gun? Don't know. It did happen quite a bit in this, and yes, we were learning along the way. In other words, when I first started shooting this Mosin, I really wasn't paying attention to how I was loading the cartridges in, to be honest with you. And then as I learned about rim lock, I'm like, oh, I better sequence those in. And yes, I know by stripper clip, you should like lift up the cartridge and make sure they kind of fan down an angle so they stack appropriately. Um, I don't know. I'm just single feeding them in from now on. If I ever get some real Russian steel stripper clips, I'll try those. You know, see if those work. I looked around online, didn't find them. I'll probably see like 100 guys in the comments now. Oh, so-and-so has them.
I know, can't find everything. Uh, I probably forgot some stuff. Let's press ergonomics. Firepower. It ain't tons. It's five rounds, man. That's in line with the period battle rifles. I mean, five in the magazine, one up here. It is what it is. Um, I will tell you this, though. We're talking a pretty powerful cartridge once again, and I think we need to talk about that as part of the firepower discussion. Basically a 30 out 6 or 308, whichever you want to say. That's a powerful cartridge, one that can take down a, any North American big game animal with a proper shot. I'm not talking full metal jacket rounds, by the way. I'm talking like a hunting round. Uh, some guys say they use a 207 grain brown bear soft points. This one is, by the way, this particular one is, let me look at the bottom. This is a 1080, I think. Yeah, it's a 1080. So that's a Bulgarian 147 grain LPS. So basically light bullet steel core. And then the other rounds I shot in this gun were LPS rounds, 2275s. And if my research is correct, those are Romanian. I have the top of that right here. Oh, right there, buddy. Yeah, it went through two plus tens of this stuff. Various rounds, actually. Firepower, though, when we talk about that, don't forget what a powerful cartridge it is. It did. It started out uh, in its battle career. I'm talking the, the basically the 76254R, I think, with a 210 grain bullet, and the experience of the Russian-Japanese War 1904-1905 led them to say, "Hey, uh, we need a lighter weight bullet." So they went to a 147 grain Spitzer with about 9.7 grains of ball propellant. That's what this one is right here. And I will tell you, I am very impressed with the ammo that I've shot out the Mosin. One, in its accuracy. Two, in its reliability. And I don't even know what number three is. And yes, it is corrosive. Guys will say, well, it's corrosive, man. It's going to totally waste your rifle. Um, I don't find that to be a problem, especially in the Mosin. Clean your gun with Hoppy's number nine, just like I have. You won't rust your gun. Um, I didn't see any hardly blowback at all to the bolt. Firepower is pretty awesome. That's a 120-year-old cartridge, by the way. Still going strong. Uh, wow, it's affordable, too. Materials and quality. I've kind of talked about this already. Um, the quality levels on the Mosin are actually pretty good. If you get one made during the war years, I'm talking like, I don't know, 1941, uh, specifically 42, 43. They're very rough-hewn rifles. Okay, they didn't sand them very well. Um, you know, the, the, the receivers were very rough-finished. But the functionality of those war era guns is still pretty good. The steel is pretty excellent. When you go out and buy your Mosin, I would take probably a few minutes to examine your example before you buy it and look for rust. Look for some common sense things. You're going to have a hard time probably deciding how good that barrel is because it's going to be so packed in Cosmoline. I would probably try to avoid a counterboard one because that's one that's probably shot a lot. If you can, get one that has, uh, I don't know, just like this, a regular bore on it or a muzzle that hasn't been counterbored and has a lot of rifling left. All the examples that I've shown you on the table shoot very accurately. Speaking of which, let's jump into that right now. Actually, durability, accuracy, eh, whatever. I'm going to go into accuracy right now. Okay, shot all the guns over a period of, I don't know, a year and a half or so. Here's number one, Mosin. That's the one with the red dot sight. Whoa, dude, 25 degrees outside, that's uh, one whole group, but it's only 25 yards. That's still pretty good, 25 yards from a gun made in what, what's number one made in, I forget, 1927, decent. I'll move the target back on number one, this is, these targets are really old, I shot these a long time ago, 50 yards, okay. LPS, 147 grain. I think that's the Bulgarian stuff I was shooting, 25 degrees. Nice group here. 50 yards. This is from the bench, by the way. I'll tell you, when I shot this, I was pretty impressed with the gun. I was like, wow. Uh, I'm pretty amazed. Remember, this is surplus ammo. This is the cheapest ammo that I could find. Here's another group. Opened up a little bit. That's a millet one-inch red dot that you see right here. Nice. Let's fast forward to June 2011. 50 yards with Mosin number three. That's this one right here. Iron sights, no red dot. Results. Pretty close. That's shooting the Romanian 2275. I hope I'm right on the designation. I think I am. Uh, remember I said that back sight would not lower enough? There was my point of aim right there, even at 50 yards. Okay, so good group though. 
I liked it. That's iron sights. Here comes another one. Moving it on out to 100 yards. 20 mile an hour crosswind kicked up. These are two groups. First one, nice. These are iron sights. I'm going to roll in the footage while we talk so you can see it. There was a flyer there. And if, <laughs> I'm cheating a little bit. I probably should draw them the group out there. I'm not sure where that flyer came from. I think it's from that group. Maybe it's from that group. I don't know. I'm just going to pretend it doesn't exist. Most of the rounds right there, though, pretty decent, huh? That was a different group. I was still kind of playing around with my uh, windage there, banging my front sight around. By the way, I didn't talk about in the ergonomics. You're going to have to move your front sight, either left or right, tapping it to get it where you need to be. Um, that's with a wind too. So pretty pleased with that. Here comes another target. This is 100 yards. Iron. No, I'm wrong. This red dot. This is this gun right here. Just to see what it would do. This is shooting that 2275 head stamp LPS. Nice group. And oh, you know what? I was shooting this target otherwise. That might be a flyer up there. But the preponderance, preponderance of the rounds right there. 100 yards with a red dot. Not bad. And then finally. This is why it's real, at least for my eyes, when I'm shooting iron sights, this helps tremendously when I have a target this size. Humanoid style target, I can really, I don't know, my eyes are just getting that way. Good group, dude. Mosin-Nagant number one, that's with the red dot. 20 mile an hour crosswind, and because of that, this was my aim point on the right shoulder of the bad guy. Yep, decent group, a little bit of horizontal stringing, and that's probably as best as I can do. I forgot my rifle rest that day too, so I was just shooting off a of carpeted rest. Um, so I really didn't have max stability when I was shooting these last targets I'm showing you. Overall, I will say the Mosinagon accuracy is excellent. And I'm even talking about with this stuff. The surplus ammo I'm, I, uh, I've been discussing all along. All along, or not all along, but if you look around, guys will say they're getting about three to four inches out of their Mosins. Maybe it's an M44. 9130s, uh, like you see on the table. Some guys will, if they hand load for it, will get two inches. Um, I think three to four inches is easily achieved, even with iron sights. If you're really stable, uh, have good trigger control, even with those bad triggers that some examples will have. Um, if you're lucky, maybe two to three inches out of a 9130. And I'm talking with this stuff. And I just showed you the targets that kind of prove that. Uh, disregarding the flyers, of course. Um, good accuracy. Back to reliability and durability. I already had the rim lock, dis rim lock discussion, right? Uh, it will raise its ugly head occasionally. Watch for it. Um, just try to load your cartridges in at the particular sequence where the forward or the top cartridge rim is in front of the inserted cartridge. Okay. Um, some guys will say, well, you know, might want to check your magazine spring. Uh, agreed. And maybe replace your uh, interrupter. Also agreed. Um, you could try those things. Uh, but then again, a lot of the parts you're going to buy for the Mosins are already used and abused and thrashed. How do you know you're getting a good part? You don't. There's no new manufacturer. You're just getting a new part. You know, one off another gun that's been taken down, probably. Uh, there have been some reports that Mosins have choked in dirt. Uh, unsubstantiated by me. I didn't get my guns, like, super, super dirty. I ran them in a lot of cold weather. I never really saw anything... Um, cold related. Go look at the video uh, Arctic Ops running the Mosin Nagant. Uh, me and Croc at 20. Uh, the gun did outstanding in what I think is pretty analogous weather to the Battle of Stalingrad you know, or Russian winters. It was really cold that day and man we ran those Mosins hard. Uh, worked great. Um, so reliability and durability. The durability again, track record already proven. Here we go into you know, decade after decade of um, the gun in service with armies around the world. Proven. Reliability is mostly good, not perfect, but what gun is? Field strip. I'm not going to show this on camera because there's so many other resources where you can find it. Maybe it's other videos, websites. Um, the gun is extremely easy to field strip to clean it to the level you need to clean it. You basically just pull the bolt back. I'll just do a basic. You'll check, safe direction of course. Pull your trigger and out comes the bolt. That's about all you need to do to clean your gun. Hey, nothing fancy, did you disassemble the bolt when you ran that corrosive ammo? Uh, Negatron did not. I just cleaned it on the outside. You can see how many rounds that's ran. It's kind of stained right there. Uh, and then when I put it back, I'm talking Hoppies number nine, I clean out the chamber area very good with a flexible fiberglass brush with an oversized bore brush that will fit in there. And uh, some guys, and I didn't mention this, by the way, in, I don't know, ergonomics, will complain about the sticky bolt syndrome in the Mosin. 
Uh, I have seen that, and no, it's not related to the chamber, not my experience. But all the guns on the table have had meticulously clean chambers. I mean, I got in there, removed all the cosmoline, if there was any, and really got the gun clean. And so I don't think the, the rounds were not sticking. I think a lot of the stickiness comes from maybe a very strong mainspring spring in the bolt, like in Mosin number one that I'm showing you right here. Uh, the gun, by the way, cocks on opening, not closing. But I'm compressing the spring right here. And with a cartridge in there, sometimes it just takes a little more effort. You have to have a certain level commitment to run a Mosin well. Manhandle that thing. When you throw that bolt, throw it up, just like you see me run it. Throw it back. Don't short stroke it, by the way. You can induce a double feed in the Mosin. Bring that bolt all the way to the rear. Throw it all the way forward. Okay, just an aside. And some guys will say, well, get in there, really clean that chamber when you first get your gun. I agree. Some guy had a really good um, suggestion. Once you take the, the receiver out of the stock, take it to a car wash. High pressure, hot water. Get in there and blow all that Cosmoline off. That's good. What I did is I just used a lot of degreaser. A water-soluble degreaser. I got it at Costco. I stripped it all down. Then I got my bore brush in there. I, you know, I, I just scrubbed the heck out of it. And then I got a 12-gauge uh, bore brush, got in the chamber, spun it multiple times. Lots of clean rags. Brake cleaner came afterwards, getting all the residue off. Uh, and then once I did that, then I started my lubrication schedule. I'm running, I think, Militech on this bolt right now. And I pay, once it's clean, I'm talking, Hoppy's number nine cleaned down, which is very good, by the way, re removing um, corrosive residue from the primer. A little bit right there, a little bit right here, a little bit on the bolt sides, a little bit down here is where I'll put my Militech or whatever other lubricant you want. I think Bug and Nuster uses Vagisil. I know he's crazy. And there you have it. That's about all I have to do. And of course, I cleaned the bore um, and then oiled it inside just very lightly. Uh, let's see, anything on field strip that I forgot? You generally won't have to take the gun completely out on the trigger mechanism. I did when I Duracoated, obviously. When you're detail cleaning it for the first time, you probably will have to do that. I'm talking to take all the components down. Again, there's lots of references for that. All you need is a, it's so simple. You just drop this screw, top receiver screw when the bolt's out. Everything comes out. Get to degreasing. Okay, and that is very important, by the way. If you want your Mosin to run well, degrease it. Get all that Cosmoline out, just like we've talked about. I think you'll be happy. Whew, lots to talk about. Accessories. All right, let me talk about specifics on this. A lot of guys have seen this. They absolutely love it. They, they Guys that have shot it really love it. Um, first off, philosophy. Why would I put a red dot on a Mosin? Sacrilege, right? There it is. No way. It's actually a very effective sighting system for this rifle. One, I don't have to go with a rear-mounted optics platform, and that is a disadvantage to the Mosin. If you want to do that, you got to go with a bent handle modification, either bolt-on, not recommended, or welded, recommended, uh, which is more cost. Okay, and plus you're obstructing the feeding port. Okay, a lot of rifles do that, but I prefer to run it up here with a very lightweight sight, just like this millet one inch, two MOA red dot. Love it. Um, it is a fast uh, sighting option too. Faster than irons for me in my eyes and apparently for all the other shooters that ran it. There's another reason. And more importantly, it gives the gun a night capability. Oh yeah. Can you shoot your Mosin at night and hit what you're aiming at? I didn't think so. This gun can. Okay, proven on video. I might break separate video out showing that. Um, this is, by the way, an S&H brand optics mount. It's uh, Brownells part number 794-000-004. I think around 50 or 60. Totally worth it. Degreased those uh, retention nuts very well, and I just used blue Loctite on it, and I haven't seen any movement whatsoever on it. Being very careful how I mounted it. And that's after, I don't know, 600 or so rounds. Yeah. I think one thing weighing in its favor is that this is a lightweight optic. I don't have a big heavy scope on that that jars with recoil that may loosen that up. This color, by the way, is, I had it written down, tactical gray green Duracoat T6. Non-reflective and man, has it been durable because I've really put this gun through the ringer. You've seen it up against a barricade getting thrown around. I think it just looks so cool. Love the looks of it. Okay, so that's one way you can accessorize it. How about sights? There's a company out there called Mojo. They make very excellent sights for the Mosin. I haven't tested them. 
They look very promising. They have a .150 aperture on the rear and you can have a front aperture front as well. I hear a very precise sighting picture. Ultra cool. Maybe you hate this stock and hate this one and you really want to go something, I don't know, different. Here's a sporter stock for the Mosin. Haven't tested it, just got one. Cool, huh? And then you wouldn't have to trash your stock at all. You just put your action in it, run it. Has an, a really useful butt pad, apparently. Rubber. Again, I haven't tested it. Raised cheek piece. Better ergonomics. Pistol grip. All the things the Mosin doesn't have. Better checkering. Or checkering at all. Good. You know, is it for the purists? Probably not. Um, there's all kinds of other stuff for the Mosins you want. Diff there's a different optics mount I may do a separate video on. Stay tuned. Um, I think most guys are just going to run it stock though when I'm talking accessories. Um, and I, I highly recommend that because we're going to get down to value and wrap the video up. That's where the Mosin shines is because it is so affordable. Uh, don't go off into fool's territory and spend hundreds of dollars on your Mosin. I think you'd be a lot better off going with a modern bolt action gun if, big if, you're after performance. Lightweight, better ergonomics, all the things that a more modern design will give you over the Mosin. I don't know, witness the uh, Stevens 200 rifle in 308 for $335. You know, the, what is it, the Mossberg Trek for $260, and these are gallery of gun prices that I just went around today. Here's the Marlin X7. Okay, six and a half pounds. Look at that. It's pretty light. Marlin X7, that's a mo modern bolt action gun. What's that run? $315. Savage Axum is $275. You know, there's a lot of great high value modern bolt actions out there that are probably better in a lot of areas than the Mosin. Let's be honest with ourselves. So if you decide to put a hundred dollar Timney trigger on it, then you go with a bent bolt handle and all kinds of modifications. Next thing you know, you have spent $750 in your Mosin. Is that wise? Just depends on what you want. If you just like the fact that you customize the Mosin, rock on. You know, if it gives you enjoyment, I understand it. Uh, but if you keep it as is or do some very cost effective modifications, which I feel this one was, I did all the work myself here. That right there is uh, probably 50 to 60 with about $85 red dot. Affordable and it's cool. It's the only Mosin in the world like it, at least that I know of. Worth it. Um, watch out though. Keep, keep the modifications to a minimum or do something affordable like finishing on that stock. You're in business and it's affordable to shoot. That is a huge value side of the equation right there, is that the ammunition's affordable. So even though those other guns I just showed you, the Savages, the Marlins, the Mossbergs are great, they're not chambered for this and you can't go out and buy 440 rounds for $95. So get your change. Okay, that's a big benefit of the Mosin. It's cheap to shoot and it's very effective. Whew, man, I gotta wrap this up. Going long. Track record, talked about it all along. Let me say this, I'm gonna wrap track record up with the following. Uh, downsides to the Mosin. Stiff bolt, that is just what it is. And no, it's not cosmically in the chamber necessarily. I ran all, th all three of these, or all these two extensively, and they have stiff bolts. Uh, this one's better than that one, like I said. But you just have to run it with some authority. Mediocre trigger, it is, it's not a great trigger. Um, optics options are limited. Here's one I've shown you right here. And if you want to do a rear mount optic, it's going to get more complicated, more costly. Uh, you can get rim lock. But I think the upsides on the Mosin far outweigh the downsides. The extreme value, it's cheap to shoot, it's powerful for the money you're spending. Um, it's simple, it's rugged, mostly reliable. Um, it's cool, it has that intrigue and the history that I talked about briefly in the beginning. Um, who knows where your Mosin served? What you know, theater of battle did it serve? And that's intriguing and it's kind of special, especially when you're scoring it for around $100. By the way, I paid 80 for that one. Yeah, awesome. Um, collection enjoyment, you bet, the history. Big upside to the very venerable but much beloved Mosin Nagant. I call it the Mosin Nagant. Highly recommended for all the POUs I designated. This is a nothing fancy review. Hope you liked it. See ya.